Well, yeah. what we're going to do, guys, tonight is this is 100% about education. This is all about everybody that's on this call is uh, is a, is a infinite banking client of Zan and I's. And so what we want to really focus on is just the hows and the whys and why this uh, idea makes mathematical sense for whatever that we're doing. Okay. So um, again, thanks for being on here. We'll, we're going to send the recording of this here later. And again, this is our first time doing this. When we do this again, we're going to have our, our technology dialed in. Okay. So thanks for putting up with us. All right. So let me, uh, I want to share my screen here so everyone can see this. And I want to confirm if you can, just, again, this is our first time doing this. So if you can confirm, like everyone can see this. Okay. That would be all. Yep. Okay. And I don't know if you can see me like, in front of my board or not or whatever um okay well yeah hopefully hopefully everybody can see both both of our screens like maybe the same size hopefully but either way right now i think what's on nolan's computer is most important at the moment yes and then uh we'll hop over to the board here, here okay soon. we'll figure that but of course this again put up with our immaturity here we're, we're trying to figure this out We'll get there, right? It's going to be a, a, a total production here sooner than later. All right. To start, to, to get out of the gate, again, this whole hour is not about anything more than just information and knowledge about money. We're trying to help you squeeze more juice out of your business if you're buying real estate, how to be more efficient when buying it, how to potentially even save dollars in taxes, and also, uh, most importantly, keep money out of attorney's hands. If you haven't met Zane already, Zane is my associate, Zane Barbo. He is, um, he's been with us for multiple months now. He's been a massive asset for, for me and my business and what we're wanting to do. So what we're going to do is I'm going to walk you guys through this simple concept of compound interest. I'm then going to talk about some of the attributes of life insurance and why this is a great strategy. And then we're just going to do some real life examples of uh, Zane and I, one of our clients and how she is we'll let him explain it because he's really good at it. And then we'll also uh, mix in a real estate deal and we'll, what the math looks like. Okay. So I would ask this too, if you guys do have questions or thoughts, uh, we'll leave a little bit of time at the end. So um, remember your, your, your question or thought, write it down or whatever, or put it in the, in the uh, chat, or whatever it is, we're going to send this replay to everybody. Uh, so you can share it with business associates if they have interest in this thing too. Okay. Whatever. All right. So number one, out of the gate, we have to understand now, again, uninterrupted compound interest. That's what the, that's one of the biggest keys of infinite banking. It's talking about how our money never stops growing for us, even when we're able to borrow against the policy. You probably have seen this before where what happens if a penny doubles every day for 30 days? What does that actually turn into? I don't want to, I don't want to get all hung up on a penny doubling every day. That's not really the point. What I want to show and what I want to prove here, at least it hit me square in the nose, was look what happens to our dollar or to a penny if we don't touch it for 30 days, even if it did, but the compound interest, right? It's the eighth one of the world. So you can see over 30 days, we went from one cent up to $5.3 million because our dollar just doubled or our, our money doubled every single day, okay? But here's where it gets fishy is when we start having interruptions. And so I want to show an opportunity cost down here in the right corner. What this is showing is just what will happen, how much money you'll lose by burning the compound interest. Okay. So if we go down, oops, let's see here. Wanna... So let's just say that we introduce even a withdrawal. Okay, let's say that we take out money for anything. It could be, again, we can add zeros, we can take off zeros. But let's just say that we withdrew 100 bucks on just two separate days over these next 30 days of a penny doubling every single day, okay? If you notice in day 15, that $81, that $81 would have turned into 163 bucks. But because we took a dollar, 100 bucks off of it, it's just now at 63. And then also we took out another $100 at day 25. So it would have been 65,372, but it's 272. I want you to see what the difference is. So let me show you guys, like if you look back at this, $5.3 million of total growth, if we don't touch the money, 
But then when we do take out 200 bucks, $100 in two separate events, it burns. We only are left with $2 million. It burned the compound interest of $3.2 million. That's what we would have earned on our money had we not touched it, had we just like let it in there, okay? That's if we withdrew 100 bucks twice, okay? Let's go to the next um, event of what happens when we um, remove money. It's Uncle Sam. We take out a 15% tax. So every single day, we take out 0.15% of the growth. Look what happens to our dollar if we would have never had to pay Uncle Sam. We have an opportunity cost of $4.8 million. If you notice here, there's a star. You only pay $182,000 in taxes, but you are you lose because think about it. Your, your dollar, if it would have had the ability to earn interest, that interest could have earned interest. That's the compound interest idea. So in this case, you could have earned $4.8 million in your money, but because you paid it to Uncle Sam, it's never going to grow or earn for you again, okay? So I just wanted to show those two ideas of just withdrawing money and paying taxes and what happens to your dollar whenever you introduce those two compound killers, okay? If that makes sense. I mean, again, this is like a, not a scenario where everybody is doubling their money every day. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is, if you if you have compound interest, whether it's a, a low interest rate or a high interest rate, the point is anytime you have an interruption, it crushes it crushes what the dollar will turn into. It opportunity cost is 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 substantial. Okay, let me, let me keep, go keep going. Is that a? Nah, it's on mute. muted or something? Okay, so let's just kind of go into what infinite banking really is now. I wanted, I just wanted to kind of give a overview of what the intro, what the compounding will do, but let's talk about how you go and spend your money or how you go and buy things, how you acquire assets. Number one, you finance everything that you do. You either borrow someone else's money and pay them interest or you pay cash and you give up the ability to earn interest. It's a lot of things that people don't think about. This paying cash and giving up the ability to earn interest is, is what Dave Ramsey and the boys don't talk about. They don't talk about the opportunity cost of what your dollar could have earned, okay? So let's just, I wish I would figure this out and do this. So you can see here, if you had a hundred grand in an account, it could be higher, it could be lower, it could be add more zeros, take off zeros. That's not the point. Everybody is working on this cash line, whether it's in a checking account or whatever you're doing with your cash. The 80 percenters of the United States, if you're buying a new car, you're buying a brand new F-150, you are going to borrow someone's $50,000. You're going to get below this line. You're going to keep your 100 grand in your account. You're going to borrow 50 grand from somebody and you're going to pay them back over time with interest, okay? And then in six years, when you need a new truck, you're going to do the same thing. You're going to borrow someone's money. You're going to pay them back with interest. This hundred grand, again, you might be earning a couple of pennies. That's not the point. Point is, you're never really getting anywhere with your dollar right there because you're using someone else's money, okay? On the other hand, maybe this needs to have an extra zero. On the other hand, if you're a Dave Ramsier, you might be in the idea of saving up $50,000 and then spending 50 grand on that truck and keep on doing that. And then another five years goes by, you save it up, but save it up. And then you spend it, save it up, save it up, spend it. You discover that you're never really getting anywhere with your money. It's all the same. You don't ever end up growing this 100,000. Over time, you've got stuff. You've got cars. Maybe you've bought some buildings. Maybe you have paid off some education, whatever it is. You've done things with your money, but your cash doesn't get anywhere. You don't get anywhere with your money. It's funneling through your hands. So what infinite banking is all about is you're putting money into these life insurance policies the same way that all of you guys have. And the money is never interrupting the compounding. It's what we just showed a minute ago. You never are withdrawing capital. You're never paying taxes on the growth. Thankfully, there's no lit, depending upon the state, I guess. You're never having to dance with attorneys because they can't touch any of the money in these things. So what ends up happening is, is you have this uninterrupted compounding curve of your money. 
And when you need access to cash, you borrow against the policy to go buy that truck, to pay off education, to purchase an asset, to do whatever it is that you want to do with your money, the investments, the things that you know with in your own business, but you never take out your dollar from its growth potential. So this is where you're able to stretch your dollar and make it work twice as hard because the policy continues to grow tax-free compounding all the while you still are you, now you're using the insurance company's money to go and buy, buy the assets or pay down debts or do whatever it is that you want to do. And you're using their money. Okay. So let me just show quickly. Um, I don't know why my thing is doing like this here. So, so why are we using this policy? Why are we using this strategy? Now, again, this is more about just a, just a reminder. We've gone over this with you guys before. This is really just a, a, um, a warmer up, just, just a reminder of like, let's compare things and just see if this is actually still the, the, the truth and why it makes sense. So you can only park money in three locations. Tax today, your CDs, your money markets, you know, wherever you're keeping liquidity now, your tax deferred, maybe you guys have this, your 401ks, your IRAs, you know, Uncle Sam's partner or tax never. You can put money under your mattress. You can put money in a shoebox under your bed, or you can do this life insurance idea, okay? There's only three locations. There's really no other, there's no fourth door, okay? There's one, it's one of these things. Tax today, tax tomorrow, tax never, okay? So if we're comparing, you know, maybe the most important attributes of an account, normally it's these six pop up. It's competitive return, it's safety, making sure that our money can't go backward. It's liquidity, can I get my hands on it when I need it? Is it tax-free? Well, we talked already today, tomorrow. Is it creditor or litigation protected? And then of course the money maker, the uninterrupted compounding, okay? So let's just go through this and just show you what attributes make sense and which ones don't so you can get a better idea, okay? Now, we can talk about today being tax today's money markets being competitive, maybe, but 18 months ago, we were all getting 0.3%, right? So I would say that this is still not a competitive rate of return because the banks are the ones dictating this and they can change on a dime, okay? So they're not competitive. It's safe because you you know your money's in there. You can say the FDIC is whatever, but the fact is when you need your cash, the money's there. It's liquid. When you want to go down to the bank, you can take the cash out when you need it. It's not tax-free. It's taxed today. Believe it or not, any dollar that you put into a savings or checking account and it earns interest, it's actually the last dollar on top of all the money and the taxes that you're paying. So if you earn $150,000 and then you earn $10,000 in you know, your checking account or whatever, they take that $10,000 of interest and they slap it on top of whatever that you earn. So it's the highest taxed it's the highest tax bracket that you can get your money, that, that your money's in. So it's not tax-free. It's the worst tax. It's definitely not credit protected. Any money, I mean, any attorney is going straight after your checking account as quickly as possible. And then, of course, it's not interrupted or it, it's interrupted compounding. Whenever you take 50 grand out to go put a new roof or a new kitchen in your house, it's no longer, the 50 grand is not earning anymore. It's, it's, you know, it's a brand new kitchen or whatever, right? Tax deferred. Does that, I want to make sure that makes sense. Is that kind of like, core, do those attributes, does those, you know, checks and X's make sense? Okay. Tax deferred, it's it's almost identical. You're getting two of them. It's a competitive rate. Well, we, we hope it's a competitive. That's why it's an investment, which can go up or it can go down. You're just praying to God it goes up. You don't know, but you're hoping it's a competitive rate of return or you, otherwise you wouldn't have it in there. It's not safe. You can lose money. We all, all have experienced anytime any money has any money in the stock market, it can go backward. It's not liquid. It's tied up till you're basically 60 years old. You, you put it into a black a black hole and your uh, idiot brother-in-law or your um, uncle at Edward Jones is managing it, earning a percentage off of it. And he's not taking any risk. You're taking all the risk and you don't have any access to the cash. It's not tax-free. It's tax-deferred. You're kicking the can down the road. It is credit protected in certain states. Anytime that you got sued for someone slipping and falling on one of your properties, they can't touch your tax deferred accounts. But of course, it's the compounding is interrupted when you start to withdraw money. You start to take your distributions at the, you know, when you're 62 and you're in that retirement phase, you have $5 million in there. You take a million dollars out. You're now only earning on $4 million. Like that's just what it is. So if we get over to this far right column, this infinite banking column, now, I'm not going to include the mattress or the shoebox under your bed. Let's just talk about this life insurance idea that we have. 
you are getting a competitive rate of return. You're getting 4% guaranteed on your money, plus you're going to earn a dividend. Now, I don't want to be um, liberal with that, but you can earn ballpark 50 basis points. So I, I like to be conservative and think of the internal rate of return of this policy is going to be around 4.5%. Now, again, that's tax-free. You know, we'll go down to this out. It's tax-free. So in a competitive rate of environment, you're looking at having to earn 75 to 8% in an investment to net out what you're guaranteed in these policies, okay? So I look at this as competitive. Safety, you can't lose them. Every single year, you are guaranteed to have more money in this than you had the year before. It's completely liquid. Anytime you need a policy loan, anytime you need money, it's a simple text. Grant's done it a hundred times with us where it's, hey, Nolan, I need a hundred grand. We're gonna go buy a building. Sounds good, Grant. She texts me or she texts my business associate manager, Stacy, and she's like, hey, Grant, it's gonna be in your account three business days. That's the liquidity of it. It's completely tax-free, every dollar. And let me explain this really quickly so you can comprehend why this is tax-free. So again, remember, we're talking about insurance. If you get in a fender bender and some lady hits you, you're driving into work one day and she hits your, she hits your bumper and it's $4,000 to fix, okay? Four grand, you take it to the body shop. The guy says 4,000 bucks. You call up their insurance, the ladies insurance company. They say, no problem. Let me write you a check for $4,000. And that insurance company writes you a check for four grand and they fix your car. And then two weeks later, you're out driving your car again and nothing's, you know, and you're, you're happy to go lucky. Let me ask you something. And I would like to ask you, Brett, I'm going to call you out. If you got a check from that insurance company for $4,000, is that a capital gain? Did you gain $4,000 on when, when that insurance company wrote you a check? I don't think so. Why not? Because it's going straight to the car repairs. Nailed it. I mean, drilled it. You just had a $4,000 loss. You had a $4,000 loss because your car was dinged by four grand. So the insurance company steps in and writes you a check to make you back to whole to where you were before, to where your life is no different than what it was before. This is identical with life insurance. This is why it's tax free is because when you go and one day down the road, graduate into the next life, you have a beneficiary. And for y'all's policy at the age and the, the, the deposits y'all's making, it's going to be in the multiples of millions of dollars. And what's going to happen is one day when you graduate and we hope that your heart's right, $8 million is going to go to somebody. That person just had a $8 million on paper loss because of your because you died. Now, the insurance company steps in and makes your beneficiary whole. Therefore, they never had a capital gain. They had an $8 million loss. The insurance company steps in and makes them whole of that $8 million. Does that kind of correlation make sense so you understand the reason why this is tax-free and you will never dance with Uncle Sam? It's a big key. So, and then, oops, then creditor protection, of course, um, and that's the, the, one of the main reasons why it's credit protected is because you do have a beneficiary. So whenever you take a policy loan, and I tell all my all of my partners the same thing, whenever they are going to do a real estate deal with me, and we can talk some numbers here in a few minutes, whenever you're doing a real estate deal, it's putting money into the policy, protecting your cash, taking a policy loan, and injecting into the deal. That way you've just solidified that you're using the insurance company's money for the deal, but you've also protected your own cash. And the reason why is that is because it's the policy loan is really, quote unquote, the beneficiary's money, not technically yours. So if they were to sue you, they can't take the beneficiary's money because it's, or they can't take your money because it's actually not yours. It's the beneficiaries on paper, according to the IRS. And I'm not an accountant. I'm just, that's just what, you know, how it's, how it's worded. And then finally, the most important piece, uninterrupted compound interest. When you have money in these policies, whether it's a lot or a little, these dollars are guaranteed to never be touched by Uncle Sam. They're never going to be touched by an, by, by an attorney. And they grow forever, no matter if you borrow against it or you don't. Okay, let me give you one example. And then I'll turn this over to Zane so he can show you guys an example. But if you go buy a piece of real estate, okay, let's say it's a million dollar house or a million dollar building, and you put $100,000 down, it, does, it doesn't matter what the numbers are. But when you go and put money down, and you go and borrow against this to go and redo the kitchen, redo the bathroom, whatever it is. No matter what, whether you've borrowed out 100% or you've borrowed out zero, you've paid off the house. Whatever you've borrowed against the property does not affect the appreciation of the property. 
Now we can get into the real estate weeds of what the appreciation is in the market, but let's just say that a property appreciates every year 5%, no matter what. The, the property does not know if it's leveraged against or not. It doesn't have, it has no clue whether there's a mortgage against it or whether it's free and clear. This is identical with life insurance. The insurance company does not know that they do not care if you've borrowed against your policy for whatever reason. It doesn't matter if it's an investment. It doesn't matter if you're buying off, paying off a car. It doesn't matter if you're taking your family to Disney World. It doesn't matter. The policy does not know. It does not uh, recollect if it has been borrowed against because it's going to appreciate no matter if there's equity or no equity. That's really the main key. That's why this thing continues to go into oblivion um, no matter what. So again, putting our money in certain locations means something. It's valuable. It's, it, it, it needs to be understood because when we start putting in money in these other locations, which we have zero control over, we don't have any control over the CD. We definitely don't have any control over our freaking 401k. But this tax never account, we are in complete control of this thing. We dictate the amortization. We dictate the terms. We tell the insurance company if and when we want to pay this policy loan back. You're in control of every piece of this thing. And that's why I'm just really passionate about it. Because when you start coupling this thing with how to use policy loans, which Zane will get into in a second, when we start talking about how to pay off debts, how you're able to purchase debts, you're able to, to own collateral and, tr and control cash flow. You end up having all of this. You own everything and all the cash flow is funneling towards you instead of away from you. That's where it gets really sick. And so, Zane, if you don't mind jumping over to this, um, I just wanted to give a quick backstory again as to which you guys already know we've all been over this, but just getting an understanding as to why we are doing this and how important this is to understand when we go and start talking about buying, you know, buying debts. And then we'll show an example of purchasing a real estate property here in a minute too. Okay. So, so mute yours and I'll unmute. Okay, cool. So All mind. right. I'm going to mute this. Stop sharing. Yep. Okay, cool. Thanks guys. So, Zane's going to take over. Okay. Hopefully everybody can hear me. Okay. Hopefully everybody can hear me right now. Um, Give a thumbs up. Make sure you can hear, please. It's good. Okay. Cool. okay good. Awesome. Um, awesome. So, I hope that all that that Nolan went over was a good preface for what we're gonna get into now. Hopefully the camera is all nice and lined up for you guys. Hopefully you can see this stuff. Um, I don't have the best handwriting, so don't judge me. But um, this is going to be an actual example of a real client um, that we worked with uh, last year. Right? So this client was a, she, she's a dentist now. She has about 40K left in student loans, okay? I try to keep this kind of short because we want to finish this in about an hour. We know you guys' time is valuable, but um, she was spending about five hundred twenty-five bucks a month in both principal and interest, of course, to uh, pay off these student loans. So she's doing well. She has about thirty-five k in savings. She had a policy with us. She is going on her second year last year, um, and so after her first year, you know, she had about sixteen k liquid. Because that first year, you know, you get that 60-40 ratio that the IRS uh, requires. Uh, she had about 16K liquid, and uh, she was thinking about borrowing some of that 16K and then taking some of her cash and combining those two and paying off her student loans, um, or, or at least paying off a huge chunk of them, right? She could definitely do that, right? She could totally, she could totally pay off the student loans with cash and then redirect those, those monthly payments back to her bank account. Well, we were like, okay, wait a second. What if, you know, you can just fund the policy in year two with your savings, just simply run that cash straight through, through your policy, have that money compound for you forever in your policy, and then borrow it right back out and just go take out that debt. And at that point now, she owns that debt, okay, for no extra effort, no extra risk, and no extra taxes, she is now in control of that debt and those principal and interest payments are going back into her system to refill that bucket. Now, like I said, she could have done this in cash and she could have refilled her bucket. But the thing is, just like what Nolan was saying, that cash would be out of her system that whole time. And she could be refilling her bucket and earning interest on that. But you gotta realize that every single dollar in your system has the potential to earn interest and compound for you. And when that, those dollars leave your system, they stop compounding for you, obviously, right? So our whole point here is it's just simply mathematically more efficient to go and borrow against your policy, 
let that money continue compounding, never let that stop, and then just redirect those payments that you were paying to the bank and those interest payments that you were paying to the bank back to your own policy and to your own bank so that that money never leaves your system and it continues to compound for you for the rest of your life. Um, so that, that was just kind of like an overview of a simple example uh, of a really good, uh, a really good solid example. I kind of rounded the numbers there just to make, to make it simple for everybody. Um, but that's pretty much, um, I, I understand that everybody's situation is different. And um, of course we want to help you guys kind of go into your own situation uh, whenever, whenever we can, whenever you guys have a situation where you want to either take out debt or take out real estate. And we'll get into how we can kind of like help you guys out more doing that later on. But Nolan is kind of going to go over his uh, real estate example and how he uses it, not always to take out debt and take back control of, of, of debt and redirect cash flows into a system that way, but go more into how he acquires assets and how that's mathematically, just simply mathematically more efficient to do it through a policy instead of cash. Um, first of all, does, does all that make sense though from this debt example? Can we get like a thumbs up? Yep, absolutely. Okay, thanks. Thanks everybody. Uh, Nolan, if you wanna, yeah. if you wanna, go ahead. All right. Let me make sure this is uh, and, uh, I'll, I'll adjust this. Okay. You can actually use this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Still good? All right. Okay. So in this situation, what I want to do is I want to go over why we use policy loans to purchase real estate. Okay. One of the biggest keys, if you're not into real estate yet, you probably will be because this is the fastest way to achieve financial freedom, at least in my um, my experience, at least. I don't think we're good. No, yeah, that's only okay. Okay. So, so Zane was showing you guys ways that you can pay off debts, which is an important piece because it's about controlling cash flow. It's about owning debts, purchasing debts, owning, not changing anything in your life, just knowing where the the, the location of those cash flows go. When you get in control of those cash flows and control of those debts, the next logical move is to start deploying capital into investments that are going to pay you passive income. Because the real goal at the end of the day, as we're all trying to chase, this financial freedom, right? When everyone talks about it online, you read about it in the forums on bigger pockets. It's how do I have more passive income that exceeds my monthly expenses? So therefore, I can show up to work every day, I can do the shit that I love to do and not feel like I have to actually go trade my time for money, right? If I'm if my monthly expenses go out to dinner with my family, go on vacation once a month, and it costs me eight thousand to live, but I've got eighty five hundred bucks a month of passive income, I've exceeded that, and I can truly go to work every day because I like going to work, not because I have to to pay for my bills. Right? That's what we're all chasing. We're all doing that whole song and dance. So, if we know that that's really the real goal, it's not it's not necessarily owning real estate. It's not having these retirement accounts, like that's not really the point. To distill it down, in my discovery, it's about spending our time how we want. That's truly what it's about. That's why we use this life insurance idea and then we couple it with this real estate, which I'll show you in a second, what the returns look like. You're talking about being able to speed that process up because that's why people put money in retirement accounts. That's why they're dancing around with Uncle Sam with these 401k. It's because they have this idea that in the future, I'll have so much more money of you know, streams of income or as we're distributing this cash out of these retirement accounts, I'll have enough money to live my life and spend my time all I want. Let's figure out how we can shrink that and get there a whole lot faster through some really cool real estate deals. So let me just show you the math on this so you can understand and see why. First, we're going to see what a, a cash deal looks like, what a bank deal looks like, and then what happens when it gets really crazy when you couple them together, okay? So... I know this is small. Can you zoom that in on this? Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, sure. I'd like to zoom this in just so you guys can see the numbers because I, I kind of made it a little small. Um, kind of make it to where it's like this. Again, guys, thanks for putting up with us like being super novice on this. But I, I, I would like you guys to see the map. Maybe up a little higher. Okay. There we go. Okay. Now I know this is like, I know this is like, um, just scoot the thing in. Scoot the thing in. Okay. It doesn't matter. Whatever. Here's what we're doing. So in this left column right here, what this is showing is our cash. If we did, a, if we bought a property with cash, the center one is if we bought a property where we borrowed money from a bank. 
And then the last one, which I'll go over all these numbers in a second, this last column is talking about if we use the bank and we use our life insurance policy, okay? So number one, let's just say that we bought this property for a million dollars and you can take off a zero, you can add a zero. That's not really the point. The point is, is just what is the cash on cash return? Because for me in our CRE collective, which is our uh, private mentorship for commercial real estate, the most important metric that the hill I'm willing to die on is cash on cash return. I'd rather take less cash flow per month, but to know that I have less money in the deal, it makes my cash on cash return go way up. So for me, my most important piece, and for the investors that I work with, it's cash on cash return. So that's the metric that I'm gonna show here, okay? So if we bought, let's say that you're uh, an institutional investor, you got all this money, you just won the lottery, you bought this building for $1 million, okay? And this rent is a triple net lease, meaning that the tenant pays all the expenses. So you're going, you are going to net every year $100,000. Now, these are super round numbers, that's not the point. This is more just so you can cerebrally understand the how and the why. You buy this building for a million dollars. The rent is $100,000. So the return on investment or ROI, that metric, how you discover what that number is, is you take your net operating income, you divide it by your injected cash or whatever money you put into the deal. So that means ROI is $100,000 of net operating income. We divide it by the money that we put in, which was a million dollars. So that equates to a 10% return. Now, in a lot of phases, nobody's really getting out of the stock market. So 10% is not bad. Now, I'm not even talking about all the attributes of real estate, like the principal pay down, the interest deductions, the depreciation. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking specifically about the return of the deal, okay? Now, 10% return, not bad. Double digits, pretty hot these days. Let's look at what happens if we use a bank and we borrow someone else's money. Let's just see what happens to the return. Let's just see if it makes more sense to use cash or to use the bank. Let's just look at the math. Same deal. We buy the property for a million bucks. The rent's a hundred grand. But now we've got a mortgage of 750,000. We borrowed at a 75% loan to value from the bank, okay? They, loan, they, they like the tenant. They think it's a great deal, yada, yada, whatever. So we borrowed 750,000 from the bank. Our down payment was 250 grand, right? Whether it's me, whether it's you, we injected 250 grand of our own capital into this deal. Now, because we borrowed the bank's money, we have to pay debt service to it. We had a service debt, and that's gonna cost us 60 grand a year, right? Could be higher, could be less. It's not the point. It's super round numbers. So we're borrowing their money, and it's costing us 60,000 a year in interest to use their money, okay? So if we do the same metric of return on investment, so 100 grand of cash of rent, we subtract our debt service of 60. That leaves us with a cash flow or a net operating income of $40,000. But because we only had to show up with 250 grand, that ratio, now our injected equity is only 250. So if we take the same return or if we take the same metric, 40,000 divided by 250,000, that leaves us with a return on investment of 16%. Okay, so stop for a second and think about this. We can do the cash deal, and yeah, you don't have a mortgage, right? You're in control of the whole thing. You're doing whatever. That's not the point. You only make 10%. Can we all be in agreement that using other people's money makes mathematical sense? If we can use the bank's money, if we can use a private lender's money, I would much rather pay somebody interest then give up my ability to compound all my money, maybe in a policy, maybe even your own checking account. The whole point is, is that the opportunity cost of your money, when you burn it, when you take it out, is way higher than paying somebody else a couple percentage of interest. Just remember that, okay? But if we look at this, these two ideas for a second and show that we have a 10% return with cash and then we use someone else's money and our return went up, mathematically, it makes sense to use the bank's money because we will squeeze more juice out of this deal. To get to the third door, which is the best piece that I discovered and I get the hill that I'm willing to die on. What if there was a way to extract more juice out of this deal? And it's not based on trying to squeeze more juice out of the seller, creating a better term, more creativity on the seller. No, that's not the point. What we're talking about now is where is the down payment come from? Where are we injecting the equity from? So if we do the same exact thing, so follow along. Purchase price of a million dollars, 100 grand in rent, 
our debt service, we borrowed 750, we brought 250 to the deal, so our debt service is 60,000. Now, here's the biggest kit, the difference, here's the key. We take a policy loan at 4%, which is what we have to pay the insurance company when we borrow their money, right? Because nothing's free, right? We Like I showed you guys earlier, you're either giving up interest or you're paying interest. It's one or the other. There's no in between. We're going to keep our 250 in our policy. This is going to continue to compound. It's going to earn. We're not removing our dollar. We are going to use our policy as collateral. We're going to take a $250,000 policy loan and inject that as the down payment. We're still borrowing 750 from the bank. We're going to take 250 from our policy from I like Emeritus. That's the company I like. I got all my policies with. You can whoever. We're going to they're going to charge us 10 grand basically to borrow their money. So let's do the same math. Our ROI is what? Our net operating income divided by our injected equity. I like to say instead of injected equity, I like to use this as interchangeably as our cost of capital. Okay. So 40 grand after we service our debt of 60. So we're bringing home 40,000. Now let's just subtract not the 250 that we put into the deal, but the 10 grand that it cost us to use the insurance company's money. So now you can see the true intrinsic return of a deal by using the bank's money and then using the insurance company's money. You went from 10% to using 40,000 in cash flow divided by what it cost you to buy the property of 10 grand. You went from 10% to 400% on a deal by not changing anything about the property. There's nothing different about your tenant. There's nothing different about your rent. The only difference is where did the cash come from? You were able to use a policy loan. You used, so to get really into the weeds, not only do you get all the cash flow from the, from the deal, you're paying back your, your, your policy loan on your own terms. Nobody's telling you what to do. Your policy is still compounding on that 250 because you didn't take it out. You get the depreciation from the property, which is pretty massive on a million dollar building. It's probably $200,000 that you can go to offset against your other income. You get all of this interest that you're paying to the bank. You get to deduct that. And then every time that you pay a mortgage, there's principal being built that you're able to have more equity in the building. There's just no better way to do real estate than through using a bank loan for first position and then using a policy loan to inject money as the down payment. So when you see something, again, cash on cash return being the most important metric, you're able to do the exact same deal. Nothing's changed with the actual underlying real estate transaction or the deal. It's just where did the cash come from? So you can show for a second, in this case over here, I was making a hundred grand in, in net operating. And that's what I took home every month, right? Or every year. In this case, I'm only taking home maybe 30 grand, but I have no money in the deal. So what that allows me to do is an unlimited amount of deals moving into the future. The less money I have in a deal, the more opportunities. And even if you're Elon Musk and you've got $500 billion, eventually, if you buy all properties with cash, eventually you'll run out of money. It's inevitable. You can't do unlimited deals. But if you have very, very little money in the deal, in this case, $10,000 in the policy loan interest, or in some cases, if you're able to get creative with the tenant or the seller, you can do unlimited amount of deals and you can have maybe less cash flow on each property, but you can have 50 buildings versus only being able to do two properties or two deals at a time. So I just, again, I don't know if you can tell, I'm, I'm super passionate about this. I love doing this because I've discovered this myself. I do this every day of the week in my own investing. My family, we have five policies ourselves. I'm super passionate about using this strategy. And so when you're able to see the math, how to not only can purchase debts, turn liabilities into assets, own collateral, own cash flow. And then when you get to that point of wanting to go and purchase, you know, buildings or properties or whatever it is, whether it's residential or commercial, and then you can see the math of using other people's money. It just makes sense to go and use policy loans to inject. Now, again, if you had a million dollars in a policy, maybe it might make sense to go borrow the whole million, right? We can talk about those numbers too. And I think that's really where at the end of this, we can answer a couple questions here. But I really want to have a like a, a, an individual conversation. If you have questions about where you are, you have a, a big purchase coming up, you're thinking about buying a car, buying a new building, paying off some debt, whatever it is, let's just discuss where you are that way we can figure out what's the most mathematical move for you and what you're trying to do, okay? So does that, I hope that makes sense to everybody, how I kind of walk through that so they can see the numbers. And then that way, 
you're going to be able to make a much better decision when you go pull the trigger on something versus just, you know, reading a book or listening to some podcast or reading through something on the forums on bigger pockets. Okay. So that's good. So, so this is what I'll do. Um, I know we got on here and, and, and just, we're just trying to educate you guys as much as possible, but what I'll do is email everybody on the call, a link to our calendar. And that way, if you guys have your own situations where you're trying to, you know, uh, take over student loan or buy uh, buy back your loan on a car or go invest in an asset or something or anything you want to do with your policy loans. We want to be there to consult with you basically about exactly how you can go about doing that. Um, and so we do this all the time with with our clients who have questions about about debt. Um, there's this another there's another example. Let's see what time it is. Six forty five. Um, yeah. we'll, we'll we'll open it up for questions at like six fifty. Um, but there. It's another example that I could show you guys about um, uh, that we did just very recently where a lady, she was making $4,000 a month from her pension. And uh, she said, guys, she came to us because she heard about what we do. She's like, guys, I love the concept. This is great and everything. The only problem is that I'm in a little bit of debt, a little bit of debt. Um, and, and so, a lot of bit of debt. Yeah. And so she sent us this Excel. And let me let me just share my screen with you guys. Yeah, Y'all need to see this. So she sent us this Excel document and I took her name off. Hopefully it's not on there. Um, so I, she sent us this Excel document with literally, I think this is like 17 different line items, okay, uh, of debt that she has. And she, you can see that down there at the bottom that she was paying 3,300 of those $4,000 that she was getting coming in every single month and going straight to uh, paying down her debt. She was living with her son at the time and uh, she's still living with her son right now, just living off of a little bit of money. She was doing real estate and uh, using all that money to pay down her debt. And so what we did was she said she had, she had uh, about 10,000 bucks in a CD that was maturing over, over the next month. And she was like, this is great and everything. I have, I have 10,000 bucks in that CD. And so what we did, uh, our associate, Mike Schwally, I don't know if some of you guys may have met him or not, but he and I, we went into this and we set up a plan for her to snowball all that debt using a policy over the next four years. And this is what it looks like. So this is what we kind of came up with. I know it looks kind of messy right now, but basically we, we grouped together different debts that she could take out using her policy. So in year one, she could take out all the debts in green, right? In year two, she could take out all the debts in blue. In year three, she could take out all the debts in gray and so on. So by doing that in year one, for example, by taking out those debts with that liquidity in year one, she was able to free up all that cash flow that then goes back to filling up her, bu her bucket again. Then the next year around, she's got more liquidity that she can go and take out the, the next round of debts. And then she frees up more cash flow, redirects it to herself instead of the bank, and then does it again the next year. And so we basically set up a plan for her to use her policy. And she, now she could have done this in cash, right? She could have done this in cash. But what happens when you use cash instead of borrowing other people's money? You give up the ability for your cash to earn interest in the meantime as, as you go and take that money out of the bank or wherever you're earning on and injecting it into the market or paying off his debts or whatever. So um, that's just another example that I won't go into too much detail about. But uh, hopefully this was helpful for you guys. And we kind of want to start doing this for, for all of our clients. Um, at least, what do you say, Nolan? Probably like once a quarter or once yeah. every, every six months or something like that. Yeah. Just to keep everybody like nice and educated. Um, and, and if it's I'll, helpful, at least. Yeah, if it's helpful. We don't know if this is helpful for you guys. But if it is, um, we'd also like some feedback. If, if you don't mind, you know, we're always open to feedback and advice if you guys have it. Um, and, and a lot more people uh, signed up to to come tonight, but you know how that goes. We'll we'll send them we'll send them this video we'll send them this video too because um, they deserve it. And uh, you know I think this is just a, a good way for us to make sure we're, we're um, educating as much as possible and getting you guys what you came into this whole um, this whole life insurance thing to get. At the end of the day, we just want to be helpful. It's really all it is. We just, you know, some people have questions. You feel like, ah, you know, I don't want to reach out to them. I don't want to bother them. First of all, you never bothered us. Most importantly, we just want you guys to get the most, the best experience out of 
this strategy. That's all it is. And so we just we just want to be helpful. So don't one number, no ever think that you're like bothering. Maybe you don't feel that way, but just don't feel like you ever you're bothering us. Like always reach out with questions, thoughts, whatever. And whenever you do have something on your mind and you 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 want to discuss something, we would we, we really recommend it because it's going to help you understand like the math when you go make a financial decision, whether it's a big one or small one. We just want to be helpful and help you squeeze more juice out of what you're already doing. So if that makes sense, we got these last 10 minutes. I don't know if anybody has questions or thoughts or comments or whatever. We kind of ran through that. But uh, again, we're just we, we just want to be helpful and, and and be your teammate in whatever you're doing next. So does anybody have kind of thoughts or questions? I don't want to I think Zane, if you, or if you can unlock it or whatever. But does anybody have any thoughts or questions kind of on what we kind of went over pretty quickly right there? If Derek says thank you is very helpful. Uh, if you guys have questions, feel free to either shout them out or uh, or type them in, whatever you want to do. Oh, I know or if you don't have a question, don't even worry about it. Again, this is our yeah, first yeah. rodeo, yeah. so you know. Again, we're if, if you've been into Birmingham, you see my office. It's not like we're fancy. This isn't a TED talk. We're just we just give a shit. We want to help. So if you don't have a question, no big deal. But if you do, uh, we, we'd love to answer here in the next couple of minutes. And if not, I'll just go ahead and send that Calendly link. And um, just so you guys have it for future reference, or if you if you have something in mind that you want to use your policy for right now, feel free to schedule a call um, or, or send me a text. I'll even include my, my personal phone number. Uh, you got, A lot of you guys probably already have that. Um, but either way, uh, like like we said, just feel free, to, feel free to reach out. All right, we'll, we'll shut up for 60 seconds. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've, I've got a... a a couple comments and first of all thanks so much you guys for taking the time to do this because i think this this concept is is more important now than ever i think it's always been important but i think with the rate of inflation and such i think this is where we can start to take control and, and do our part um people old old people in the past used to stash money in these things and for good reason um they were always stable and always liquid for them uh, so thanks again. I think where we can try to continue to spread the word on this, like uh, I know Nolan, we're part of the, the CRE thing, Zane as well. I think we just need to continue to get more people thinking this way because the math doesn't lie. And I think those simple examples, of those three buckets are so powerful. When people see the cash on cash returns, it's hard to punch holes in that, right? When we're all looking at the best investment. Um, a couple of different scenarios that I want to throw out um, as we we look at using this, I think the like the real estate scenario, I think is a really good one. A couple of other scenarios that even Nelson Nash talked about in his books are when you're making purchases, especially like if you have a small business. Um, he used one example, in one of his books about I think the case for infinite banking was around trucking company and okay, so you own your own business and you also have a policy. And he's paying the bank uh, X amount of dollars to lease out his trucks for his business, right? So he's essentially going to the bank, buying them or paying money out and leasing them versus he started realizing that I could actually lease those vehicles to myself. I, as the policyholder, me, myself, and I can lease it to my company. And I'm not really sure how that actually, I, I get it in principle, but I, at some point, I'd love to kind of see how that plays out in terms of how you would structure that. The math I get, but in terms of like the mechanics, that might, that that sort of gets me a little caught up there. And the second question I think, which is good for everybody too, is at some point, maybe people want to decide I'm done investing. I'm done kind of moving my money aggressively. I want to retire. What does this look like? after I've accumulated and stashed additional inflation money into my account by, by uh, taking my purchases on myself and, and taking policy loans out to pay for them, what does that look like if I'm actually pulling tax-free money out of my account uh, at some point? And just kind of see the best way to do that and what that kind of looks like against your ledger and such, if that makes sense. I think you guys are on mute. Okay. okay, okay, okay. That's why. <laughs> All right. So to answer your first question here regarding the financing company. So the way that you can imagine this, imagine there's three shells, right? So you've got um, your policy, you've got a 
financing company and you've got the trucking company. Okay. Yep. Now the insured, whoever the, you know, let's say you got a million dollars in this policy. It doesn't, it doesn't matter yep. how much or how little, right? You just got a trucking business over here. That's, that's buying trucks. That's paying interest to the bank, you know, whatever. This is the third shell. The first shell is normally just the bank, right? You, you borrow money from them and you pay them back principal and interest, right? Well, in this case, what you can do is instead, just so you can comprehend, you've got your policy. This is the shell yep. with a million dollars in cash, whatever it is. You've got this second shell, which is a financing company, right? And then the third company or the third shell is going to be your actual business. And so yep. what you actually do is when you go take a policy loan, the policy goes into the second shell or goes into the financing company's account. A okay. million dollars, which is you, a million, that, right? that shell company or that one, two, three LLC finances or lends your trucking business a million dollars. And now every month, which every you were going to pay that principal and interest back to the bank. Now, every month, instead of it going to the bank or first community credit union or whatever, it now goes to the financing company who you borrowed from, which you own. Right. Now your now your holding company is earning is is controlling the, is owning the trucks. Your financing company is earning the interest, and then your policy is still compounding. And then every month, if you wanted to, again, you control that amortization line of credit with the insurance company. But then also the four percent is now deductible because it's a business expense. So you control. So you took a policy loan from the insurance company. You yep. took that million dollars and lent it to your trucking business. So Should let's pause, million, pause for one second. To five, right? That's the whole point of that. Yeah. If now, we, every if month we, they pay you back $6,000 of principal and interest into the financing company. The financing company is capturing the interest that would have otherwise gone to the bank. Yeah. And then now every month you're funneling a, a principal and interest payment back to your policy if you want to. I would encourage it. Right. You can be an honest banker. Don't steal the peas if you've read Becoming Your Own Banker. But every month you're paying that back into your policy loan. But you are in control of every single piece. Again, you own the debt, you own the collateral, and you control the cash flow. Versus the bank making you put up your firstborn as you know collateral yeah. to that loan, especially if it's a business loan. And then that principal and interest every month going into a black hole into the bank. So now you're in control of all the moving pieces in that business, all the while your trucking business is making the millions out in the marketplace. So that's yeah. your first answer. If that if that yep. answers your question, Grant, yep. on how. The mechanics and I can show that I can make a video and show those shells on how they work. But to answer your question regarding what this you know retirement idea looks like when you're in your 60s and you're wanting to take distributions, well, remember whether you started this policy at age six, you put one on your kid, or you started at age 50. The point is, someone that's younger is going to have a lot longer road of compounding. But you're going to have money built up in this policy and you can use it interchangeably for whatever that you want all the while that you've got the policy. But let's say that for you specifically, you're like, you know what, I'm not going to use policy loans to buy real estate. I'm not going to go pay down debts. I don't have any idea or interest in any of the stuff we just talked about. I just want to have a stream of income when I retire. Maybe that's you. Maybe it's another guy. Yeah. The more money you put into this, it's going to build up. It's going to have guaranteed dividend or not, not guaranteed dividends, but it's as close to guarantee because they're going to pay you a dividend. They're just not going to tell you how much. So you get yep. a guarantee and a dividend every year. So let's just say that you put in a million dollars over 10 years. And then in 10 years, you plan to take out a passive income stream, the same way you're doing it with your 401k. Every situation is unique and different, of course. I don't know everyone's specific death benefit and, and their cash value, but it's going to continue to build up. So what you'll end up doing is let's say that you're 65 and you've got $2 million in cash value, and you've got $5 million in debt benefit, hypothetically, no matter what your age or health is, you go and take a policy loan of $100,000, okay? And that hundred grand is completely tax-free. Again, you, nobody knows. It's completely private. Nobody knows you even where the money's coming from because it's a, a private idea and entity. You take a hundred grand, it'd be the same as somebody from a 401k taking 150 grand because I got to take 50 of them and pay them to Sam. Mm -hmm. So that's the comparison. But then when every single year, you can start taking, whether you wanted a monthly, whether you wanted an annually, then it's really up to you. But you can start taking distributions or at least passive cash flow from the money that you built up into this policy. And nobody, and, and there's, there's, it's, and your money keeps growing. 
Because what ends up happening, let's say you had $5 million in death benefit and you took out 100,000. Well, you're still earning on the, the 2 million in your policy. That, that's still yep. compounding. They just slap a $100,000 lien on your $5 million of death benefit. Because again, one day down the road, when you decide to say, hey, you know, I'm gonna graduate in the next life, $5 million minus whatever you've taken out of the policy, call it, call it hopefully $2 million at that time, at that point, your policy might be worth $8 million. But what's going to happen is they're going to pay off the outstanding policy loan yep. and then give the remaining to your beneficiary. So that's what that makes, makes sense for you again. Yeah. But most Thank importantly, you. when you want to distribute this as like a as like a stream of income, like a like owning like a Walgreens, imagine like just money hitting your account every month, you can totally do that. It's you control it. You tell the insurance company what you want to do. I mean, again, yeah. it's as easy as texting my my business manager, Stacy, hey, when you're hopefully she's still here, right? I mean, 50 years, yeah. right? But you say, hey, Stace, <laughs> I'd like to turn on a $25,000 monthly distribution into my account. And she's going to say, sounds good. Do you want that like monthly? Do you want it quarterly? How do you want it? And then that's that's all it is. Nobody's telling you what to do. Nobody's telling you what you don't, you can and can't do without the money. And then just hits your account every month like clockwork. It's a, it's a passive stream of income. So mm -hmm. when that retirement idea comes up in the future, Again, we can strategize on that unique situation, depending upon your death benefit, your cash value, all that kind of stuff. But when you do have that idea to retire and turn this into a passive stream of income, like a like a piece of rental property, we can discuss how simple it is just to turn this thing on and open up the floodgates so every month you have passive income. Uh, there's a couple more quick questions. Okay, and then we'll get out of here. Yeah. Uh, but can you can you see those? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let me read these off. So we'll we'll do another uh, five, six, seven minutes. Okay. So Dallas asked in the real estate deal, what is the example of how, when to pay back the loan from policy in reference to the 10 K of interest from borrowing your policy? Is there benefit to paying it back fast? Is there really a reason to pay it back? There's not really a reason to pay it back fast. So number one, when I say, when I'm going up 10,000 in interest, when you pay any amount of money to your policy loan back, it's a daily average balance loan. So meaning, if you didn't pay back that loan for an entire year, you'd pay a total of 10,000 in interest, right? But if you paid back even 20,000, well then what it would do is it would recalculate that loan to well, now you're only paying 4% on $230,000. So you actually pay, anytime you pay any amount of money back, you actually end up paying like net less than 4%. So there's no, there's no like idea, oh, I gotta pay it back quickly. It's just a line of credit that you own and control because once you pay the money back, it's immediately available again. So you're going to put money somewhere. Why not go and put it back into one of these policies? Because then you can go recycle it versus <clears throat> paying into like, you know, if you're buying a car and you pay down your principal and interest onto GMAC, every time you pay that, that payment, it's gone versus here. Every time you funnel money back in, that just frees up more cash in your policy loan or your policy account, okay, or your cash value. Yep. And then is there really a reason to pay it back? That kind of answer that it, it's, it, the reason to pay it back is because you're going to want to recycle the cash again. Like you don't have to pay it back if you don't want to. The insurance company's on the hook for your 3 million in death benefit. But at the end of the day, you're putting, you're going to earn money. Like you're not, you're not going to earn less than you earned the year before. You're going to have to find a location for this cash. And so you might as well put it back in this, liquidity or liquidity cash account but again it's tax-free and there's no litigation I'd, I'd rather have my money in this than have my money exposed to some attorney because i've been sued before maybe like you so you don't have to put it back in here it just makes more sense to put it back in because you're going to have cash somewhere let's put it back into this location and then derek says ask do you pay tax on the auto loan interest income payments received from lease okay that's a really Good question. Let me reread that. <clears throat> Do you pay tax on the auto loan interest income? Oh, I see what you're asking. So basically, so the, the financing company, okay, I see what you're asking. So the second shell, when I borrow from the policy, from the policy and I'm lending money over to the third trucking company, the interest being earned by the by the financing company, do you pay interest on that income? Now again, that's a, that's a great question, Derek. Honestly, <clears throat> I would again. I'm not a CPA, 
I would be venturing to say if there's a gun to my head, I'd say yes, that's income. Now it's probably going to be a some type. It's not probably ordinary earned income. It's not a W two. It's probably not even a ten nine nine. You're a private money guy at that point. Now you have to talk with your accountant about exactly what that would look like. But it is income, so you can discover. But but it should almost offset, right? I'm not again. I'm not a CPA, but but your your trucking company that you own. You should be able to write that off what you just paid yourself. So it should wash, I I believe. So again, that was a good kind of one-off question that I never really thought about that way. I've always kind of thought of it as a wash or at least a way to write off any type of interest that I was going to deduct anyway. This is just going to allow you to have more control because if something goes sideways in your business, you're definitely, you can't not pay the bank. You can't pay community first, but you can take a couple of months off of your own, you know, leasing or at least financing business that you own so that would be my my answer to that that's probably not the best answer but that's that's as far as i know without being an accountant or or uh, an attorney that's my best answer so okay i know it's getting late guys i want to be respectful of everyone's time i've got kids maybe a lot of y'all do too but i really zane and i really really appreciate you guys making it tonight thanks for i know i know everyone takes some time out of the evening and if this was helpful, I, I, I genuinely appreciate your time. I know Zane does too. We, we just want to be an asset to you, straight up and down. We just want to help you achieve what you're wanting to achieve and just get there faster. Just straight up and down and get there faster. And maybe this strategy, showing the math, maybe you can be enlightened by what is really possible. Like, I think that's really the most important piece. It's like, we're not telling you something that, that we just invented. We're not like coming up with this idea. It's been around for hundreds of years. But now we're just exposing it and shedding some light on like, this is, a, this is a cool thing. This is a really cool way of doing something that you were already going to do. Let's just shrink the time horizon down and get it where you want to go that much faster. So again, guys, thank you. Zane. You can have a couple of quotes. I just want to thank everybody for making it. The technical difficulties, we'll clean this up as time goes on. But I just genuinely thank you guys for, for making it on. And we, we can't wait to see you guys in the next time. So Zane, you want to close us out? Thanks. Yeah, no, Thanks, no, everyone. No, that was perfect. No one said it best. But um. Yeah, guys, that's it pretty much. Um, I'll send you guys my Calendly link, and I'll try to figure out a way to share this video, whether it's on Google Drive or something like that. Put it on YouTube. Oh, put it on, we'll put it on YouTube, and I'll send you guys the link. Send you the link. Um, and that's it, though. Thank you guys for coming, and hopefully uh, we can help you guys out in any way we can. That's it. Thank you, guys.